Can you hear me? Am I coming out? All right, okay. Uh, well, dear friends, it's, it's really good to um, be with you here today to finish off our uh, series in the book of Ruth. And so this is our fourth and final chapter in the book um, that we've been studying throughout August. And um, I'd be surprised and impressed if anybody's been here, given it's August, for every single one of those. So I'll, I'll summarize the story briefly, uh, that, that, and then which Andy completed in his reading. Um, but before I do that, just some reflections. So this is a book that describes events which took place thousands of years ago, maybe three and th or three and a half thousand years ago. And yet its themes uh, could be from any era. So it, it's a book that includes themes about property, family, immigration, inheritance, marriage, love, uh, birth, death, justice. So, you know, I'd say that these are, these are kind of modern day themes, perhaps. In fact, they're universal themes, aren't they? They could be things that uh, people are concerned about in any era. But if you were to choose one thing that the book's about, um, I, I'll suggest this morning that it's about providence. So it's about the providence of God as it unfolds over generations. And, and what we see in the book is the juxtaposition of the providence of God, that huge theme, that huge universal theme. On the other, and on the other hand, it's uh, one family and the, and the decisions and the choices that they face in their daily life. And it's the, it's the holding of these things two together that the book presents to us. And there's lots of other things too, but that's the theme I was going to pick up. Um, so I'll, 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 re, I'll go through the story briefly. Um, uh, so chapter one, I'll be, I'll be quick. It, it, Naomi, living in Judah, her husbands and her two sons were forced to leave Judah. And they went to Moab, which is modern-day Lebanon, and, uh, to escape a famine. So, and then they're in Lebanon, Moab, and, Mo and um, Naomi's husband dies. Uh, her sons marry uh, Moabite women, but for ten years they have no children. And then Naomi's sons die, leaving the daughters-in-law as widows with Naomi. So it's just the women left. And then Naomi hears that the Lord has come to the aid of his people in, in Judah, has provided food for them, the famine is over. So she prepares to return home. And what happened next, uh, uh, Fee described when she did her sermon, the first one in this series, as the believer who doubted, meaning Naomi, and the pagan who believed. And, you know, you can go and watch what Fee said about that. But in short, Naomi returned um, from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, arriving in Bethlehem as the harvest was just beginning, and that was chapter one. In chapter two, the plot thickened. So Ruth, when they're in, uh, in helping with the harvest, Ruth goes out to the fields to pick up the grain left behind the, the harvesters. And it turns out that Naomi has uh, a mother, uh, the, Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, has a relative in Israel, a man named Boaz. And Ruth happens to be working, providentially, in a field uh, belonging to Boaz. And I'm discovering who she is, Boaz protects Ruth, providing her with safety and food and water. And that's chapter two. Chapter three, last week, Naomi's cunning plan. So as Susan recounted last week uh, here, uh, with Naomi's encouragement, Ruth visits Boaz at night and you can say with startling directness proposes marriage. Um, and how does Boaz respond to that? Well, he could have he could have responded in any number of ways. He could have humiliated Ruth. He could have mistreated her. Instead, he responded with gratitude and with decency and with love. But he, he's also very truthful with Ruth. Although he wants to marry Ruth, he can't because there's a, another man with a prior claim to marry Ruth, a stronger claim. And in, say, in saying, in, and Boaz knows the law in this, so Deuteronomy 25 is... I'll just read it. So, he, and Boaz knows this. If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. And Boaz knows he's not that man, that, uh, that man with a, uh, the responsibility or the right to, to marry Ruth. There's somebody else with a stronger claim. And that takes us to the end of chapter 3. So we're now going to do chapter 4. And, and chapter 3 ends with Naomi assuring Ruth that Boaz will not rest until this matter is settled, one way or another. So it ends in a bit of a cliffhanger. 
Um, and then, so ju just now, Andy read the chapter we're looking at today. And I think it's worth taking some time to try and understand what takes place, because it's a little complicated. Um, and what happens is this. And Boaz calls the unnamed man. So he doesn't get a name in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the story, this man. I'll call him the unnamed man, who has a stronger claim to marry Ruth, that's verse 1. And then, together with ten elders of the city, uh, verse 2, and he begins to talk to them about, not Ruth, as you might expect, but something in which we've not heard about at all so far, a piece of land. And why does he start to talk about a piece of land? And what about Ruth? And it seems that, and you know, it's, it's complicated, but it seems that Boaz has a plan. Um, and what seems to be the case is this, that he knows that Naomi, uh, the mother-in-law, owns a piece of land in Judah, in verse 3, and she wants to sell that land. But she can't sell that land because someone else is controlling it. We don't know who. Perhaps the land has been rented out or mortgaged by someone else. We just don't know. It doesn't say. We just know that she can't sell this piece of land until it's been restored to her. And again, there is a provision in the law that Boaz knows that and, and seems to be common knowledge that provides for this kind of situation. Leviticus 25. So God said to Moses at Mount Sinai, he said, I'll read it, uh, Leviticus 25, verse 23, land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine, and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. If one of your fellow Israelites becomes poor and sells some of their property, their nearest relative is to come and redeem what they have sold. And so this portion of the law gives this unnamed man the responsibility or the right, whichever way you see it, to redeem the land on behalf of Naomi, to buy it back for her. And the man agrees to do so. And only then does Boaz turn to the more important question of Ruth. And this really is kind of the moment of high drama in the whole book of Ruth. It's where the tension is most concentrated and, you know, the outcome is uncertain and you don't know what's going to happen. We know, what, we know what Ruth wants to happen. We know what Boaz wants to happen. But whether they'll be able to get married depends on somebody else and what they're about to say. And that person so far has not been shy in exercising his full rights under the law. So it's like a build-up of tension in the story here. And to understand it, I kind of feel like you'd probably need to be a lawyer, okay? And but we're fortunate because Boaz seems to have the mind of a lawyer. He's worked out three things. So, so these are the three things that Boaz seems to have worked out. First, that on its own, the opportunity to buy the piece of land from, uh, from Naomi will prove attractive. That's a good thing. Like he, he can anticipate this man will want to do that. It's expensive buying the land, but it will be a worthwhile opportunity for this man. Uh, it will cost the man money, but the man will gain a valuable piece of land. That's the first thing Boaz seems to have worked out. The second thing that Boaz seems to have predicted, quite reasonably, is that marrying Ruth might also be an attractive proposition for the man. So buying the land or marrying Ruth, either one of those two things is a good, he can predict a good thing to do and would seem like good ideas. But Boaz has also worked out a, a third thing, that doing both together redeeming the land and redeeming Ruth, that will not be a, uh, an attractive prospect for this man. Because if, if Ruth later has a baby, as was the expectation, the man would lose the land he had acquired at considerable expense from Naomi. The land would res revert under the law to Naomi's family and her descendants. So he's worked this out, that if, he, if, he, if the man has to do both, he won't want to do either of them. So Boaz presses the point, verse 5. On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. And so the man responds, as Boaz seems to have anticipated. I cannot redeem the land and marry Ruth, because I might endanger my own estate. So it seems that Boaz has got him in a corner. If the man accepts his responsibilities in one case, to Naomi and the land, he implicitly accepts his responsibilities in the other case, which is to marry Ruth, and so he feels he must refuse to buy, to buy the land uh, and marry Ruth. So then Boaz says, and he seizes his moment, Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, this is verse 9, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Marlon. 
I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Marlon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. So Boaz has engineered a happy turn of events, simultaneously acquiring the land and marrying Ruth. But the story is not yet finished, because Boaz and Ruth, they do indeed have children. Um, Verse 16, Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And that, of course, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that that, is, that King David is, that David is King David, which means that Ruth and Boaz turn out in the providence of God to be King David's great-grandparents. And the book ends there with a bit, with a bit of genealogy, but the history uh, and the story does not end there because if you fast forward 30 generations... The New Testament opens with a genealogy that specifically names Boaz and David as the ancestors of Christ, which means that this whole story is altogether bigger than anyone involved uh, anticipated. So that's the story. I hope it's what a complex story is at least reasonably clear. So the question then, what what does it all mean? What does it have to teach us? And there's so much we could talk about here. It's such a rich book, I've realized. It's kind of daunting to try and, and say what it means. Um, and sometimes you, you, you read about a book of the Bible and everybody agrees what it means. That's not the case with, with this book. Um, there, there's so many different interpretations. And the first thing you read is nobody agrees what this, this book's, what its one point is. Um, so, so some people think, well, it's a story about redemption. So Boaz redeems um, Ruth. Maybe also Ruth uh, redeems Naomi in the book. Maybe Obed redeems the whole family. And you could, you know, you could go into that theme and and it could be very rich. Um, There's more, slightly more esoteric interpretation. So some people see the the kind of the legal contest between between Boaz and the unnamed man as a a kind of like the contest in the wilderness between uh, Jesus and Satan. I don't know, it feels a little um, wild for me, to me, but possibly. Uh, there's another school of thought, a more, slightly more secular school of thought, which says that, well, really all it's doing is um, there was some nervousness around the time of King David about his own ancestry and the fact that there was a, uh, a Moabite whim, woman in it, and they wrote this book to kind of make it all right, and to, for, so it has a political purpose. Uh, that's possibly true. But, and, and possibly all of these things are true. Um, but I'll, I'll, try and, I'll try and give a view... Uh, if you really step back, what, what's it telling us? And I, and, I've, and I already said at the start, really, I think it's a, a story about the contrast and then the links between two things. So on the one hand, the providence of God unfolding through history. That's on the one hand. And on the other hand, it's about the lives that people lead, people like us. You know, uh, we're not so different from, from this family. And the choices we make, and we see them making lots of choices, don't we? Um, we see uh, whether to travel abroad, to return from abroad, to seek an income, to marry, not to marry, to seek justice. These are the kind of things which, you know, at some time in our lives we'll probably all face these kinds of decisions, and they're faced by this family. But how do they marry up? How do they make, co- make it cohere between God's, you know, big plan and our small plans in our lives? How do we face these kind of choices and make sure that w- our choices accord with God's uh, plan? Um, that's not it. That's that's a big question. Um, I'll try and give you some thoughts about it. Um, but first, let me just. I would like to give you an illustration. So a, a, a little. Um, we go on a little uh, digression here. So uh, I once heard a story about the first Westerner, the first Western person, an explorer who ever, first person who ever seen the Himalayas. Okay. So f- five or six hundred years ago. There was um, somebody exploring, a Western explorer in the north of India, kind of breaking new frontiers and seeing new things that nobody had ever seen before. And he was with a guide, and he heard about this vast range of mountains to the north that um, they're you know, really inaccessible. And um, so obviously he wanted to see them. So he got this guide to take him. And after several days or weeks of traveling to see the Himalayas that he'd heard about, um, he was going through a mountain pass. The view opened up, and there before him, and his guide pointed, and were the Himalayas. It was this vast mountain range, bigger than anything he'd ever seen before. And it was sort of lived up to everything he could have hoped for. Every description, it exceeded them. And, and what made the scene even more spectacular was that behind the Himalayas, there was this vast and towering um, 
bank of cumulonimbus clouds going kind of 30,000 feet into the, into the air, covering the sky from east to west. And the mountains were silhouetted against these clouds. And so he stood, you know, amazed, and asking his, question, his guide questions about what the various features were and so on. And then he mentioned the clouds, and he said how scenic and how picturesque it is to see these mountains with these clouds behind them like that. And then the guide, the guide said, well, what clouds? There are no clouds. The sky is clear. And then the explorer realized that what he had taken to be the Himalayas and that he was asking questions about, they were only the foothills. And the great towering white clouds, those weren't clouds. They were the Himalayas, these, these 30,000 feet into the, into the sky. They were so vast, uh, so, like nothing he'd ever seen before, that his brain just couldn't comprehend them. It just misinterpreted them as something else entirely. And so the providence of God is a bit like this, um, and we see it in the book of Ruth. We live our lives, like the characters in the story, in the foothills. Um, but unfolding ahead of us is the vast uh, eternal providence of God. And so we must try to reconcile these two things. The, the smallness, relative smallness of our lives, of the, the eternal pun of God. Um, and so let me draw two, two lessons from Ruth about, about this. I mean, the first lesson we've got to draw from Ruth, I suggest, is simply that God does have a plan. Um, and we see it, so the plan that, that we saw a little bit of the plan in the book of Ruth and, and in, uh, onwards into the New Testament, which is uh, the bit we saw there was the ancestry of Christ. But what is, what is God's plan? You know, if we're going to assert what is God's plan? Well, Colossians 1 um, verse 15, I think, is one place where we hear about God's plan, and it places Christ at the center of the, center of the plan and, and of history. And I'll just read it to you. It's just five verses. It's a good summary of God's plan. And it says this, uh, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So that's a five-verse version of it. If you want a one-verse version of God's plan, Romans 8, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. So the point, I suppose, is, is and I, I hope this is encouraging, that number one, God has a plan, and, that, and, and secondly, about this, God will complete that plan, and there's nothing we can do about that, right? So there's no mistake we can make in our lives that will mean that God's plan does not reach fulfillment and completeness. There's just nothing we can do about it. You can't ruin God's plan. There's nothing that Naomi or Ruth or Boaz or the unnamed man in the story could have done, no error, no sin, no failure that would have stopped the plan reaching its total and full completion. But we, it's kind of frustrating or, or anxiety-inducing sometimes when we can't see that plan unfolding. Um, so it seems perhaps that Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, they got it, they got it wrong sometimes. So no, Naomi, to her credit, perhaps was honest enough to vocalize when she was frustrated that God's plan didn't seem to be working out for her. Um, Ruth was far too discreet to be caught doubting like that, but she must have had her doubts. She left prosperous Moab, and she was picking waste barley in a field and living with an occasionally grumpy mother-in-law. And, and Boaz, he had nerves of steel, it seems, but the moment at the gate, at the gate when, they, when he was trying to work this negotiation, it must have tested him. He must have felt, am I doing the right thing? Has God got this situation? So it's quite normal, I think, to, to be, feel anxious or even frustrated about how, how's God's plan working out. But there's another thing, too, which is that um, even when the characters in the book got it completely right, when their faith in God's providence was very strong, none of them ever saw the full picture in their lives. They never saw what we see. So Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz thought that this was a wonderful story about getting a son, which is, which is wonderful. Um, but the author of the book 
they thought they knew the story. They stepped back and they thought, well, I know the story. This is one, even more wonderful than they thought. It's a story about a king's royal bloodline. And, and the author wrote the story and thought that, well, that's it. What, what more is there to say? And then that was the view for the next 30 generations. Its readers thought that too. But it was so much more than that. And this is how it is for us too. We don't see God's plan working out. Um, so I love 1 Corinthians 13. For now, 12, just, just one verse. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So we'll know one day. We don't know. It's kind of, it's, we have to be okay with that. There's lots we don't know about God's plan. Probably most of it. Um, a Christian philosopher, Kierkegaard, he said that life can only be understood backwards but it must be lived forwards. And right now, we're living our lives forwards, aren't we? One day, we'll see our lives, our own lives, in their bigger context, not from the inside, from standing on the foothills, but from the outside, when we're standing on the mountains of God's providence and looking back at how far we have come. So that's one message of Ruth. And I've just got one more, one more thing to say, um, one more point to make. So the first message is that God has a plan but we don't always understand it, and that's okay. The other, the other thing is that Ruth does is, I think it gives us examples of how to live in that here and now. So how to navigate the choices and live in a way with, that accords with God's bigger plan. And it's not like a book in the New Testament, like something written by Paul, which is, instructs us. You know, uh, Paul likes to instruct. It, it's a book that gives us examples the models how living in the here and now, how living well in the near and now, what it looks like. And so we, particularly in the case of uh, Boaz, the man of standing. Because Boaz, he's not a man who gets anxious because he doesn't see how uh, the plan of God is working out in his life. He doesn't see it in full. Um, and so once I, I went to a, hear a, a talk by a, um, an, a, an kind of an elderly minister who'd been... Uh, leading churches for maybe 50 years or more, reflecting on his life of, of leading churches. And he said that something that had taken place over that period was that people he had found um, in, in the churches had become increasingly anxious about what the will of God was for them. So he said that they would, they would, they would be anxious, wanting guidance. Does God want me to do such and such? Go here or there, marry somebody or not marry them. And very often, what they're really looking for, he said, was a sign from God. Perhaps uh, a vision or a mystical experience of some kind. Or a strange series of coincidences that if they read them right, that it directs them in a particular way. And they must be always alive to this, um, this kind of influence and special revelation. Or uh, it might be a sudden voice or a vivid impression, a sudden vivid impression of a particular Bible verse. And it seemed to be that that's what they expected Christianity to be like, being a Christian is that you need these kind of inputs from God. And they would come to this man, he said, and they, uh, this, this minister, and they'd say, you know, I'm struggling. What is the will of God for my life? How do I know that God is leading me? Or what is he leading me to do? What is the will of God for my life? And so this minister would, he found that the thing to say, well, he'd first say, well, I, I'm glad you've come to me because I do know the will of God for your life. And so they'd lean in, kind of wide-eyed and expectant. And he'd say, yeah, it's here. 1 Thessalonians 5, it's verse 16. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Or on other occasions, he, or even if they pressed him further, he'd say, okay, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. And... Very often people, he said, would go away disappointed that God's will was so mundane and so obvious and so, so um, unexciting. Uh, and, uh, but, but that's not the approach we see that Boaz takes. So Boaz doesn't seek these kind of special uh, revelations that, uh, direct to him. Uh, he doesn't look for sort of mystical experiences. Boaz is, seems fully confident in the gifts that God has given him to make decisions and that God, by the way, that God has given us in even greater measure. So what are, what are those things that, that, that Boaz uses to make decisions, it seems? Well, first he walks in step with God. He calls on God's name, uh, even though he doesn't ask, even if he doesn't ask God for special revelations in the moment, the name of God is always on his lips. 
And you, if you look at his dialogue in the book, he's constantly uh, invoking the name of God. Um, second, he knows God's word. We, saw, we knew how he'd, he understood the law and was able to apply it. And third, and this is a crucial thing, I suppose, is that he tests, right? So he tests when he, when he believes he's, he's, uh, there's a way forward for him. Um, and this is what we can do too, and we're instructed to do that. So Romans 12, verse 1. Uh, it's just two verses. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So that's a promise, okay, that we will be able to test and approve God, what God's will. How? Well, first it said, the passage, Romans 12, we must be saved. It says, uh, in view of God's mercy, we must accept God's mercy. Second, we must be sanctified, or increasingly set apart, um, refusing to be conformed to the pattern of this world, verse 2. And third, through the Spirit, uh, that the passage teaches us, we must allow, allow our minds to be renewed and transformed. Then we will be able to test and approve God's will. And, and the thing about testing is important. Um, uh, we know that he, he knew the scriptures. We know that he was walking in step with the Lord because he, it's clear from his conversation. And we know by his conduct throughout the book that he is not conformed to the pattern of this world. And that he was able to act boldly and confidently to do what was right. But he also tested it. Um, he gathered the elders. He conducted a, a, a rigorous process of scrutiny to determine the way ahead. And he used, in doing all of that, he, renew, he used his renewed mind. And we should do that too. We should use our renewed, transformed minds to test and prove the way ahead. And I, I must say, in this church, I think we're very blessed to have a system of church governance that allows for the thorough testing of decisions. And I think that before I joined this church um, and became one of the deacons here, I don't think I fully appreciated how precious and valuable it is, the system of church governance we have. Um, uh, I do now. Uh, in the big decisions are not in the hands of one person or a few people but they're in the hands of the members. And whether it's appointing new members or appointing a new minister, these are decisions not made by the church leadership, but the members. And as together we reach decisions, we don't need to appeal to uh, mystical experiences or odd coincidences that are telling us something or strange confluences of events or even to defer to some spiritual elite who claim that only they know really what God wants. No, we decide together, using our renewed minds, discussing and thinking things through. And we test, knowing that by testing, we both avoid bad decisions as a church, and by testing, we also gain, gain great confidence that the decisions we do take are the right decisions. And like Boaz, we do it with reference to God's declared will, which is not hidden from us, but made plain in the scriptures and illuminated to us by the Spirit. And thank God for that. And so to conclude what I have to say this morning, that has been the book of Ruth we've read through, the, through August. One of the best, most vividly written stories in all of this, all scripture. Uh, gives us a huge wealth of interpre uh, interpretation and inspiration. And I hope we can go on encouraged by it, uh, that God has a perfect plan is working all things for the good of those who love him, those who love him now and those who will love him in future. And as we face choices and decisions as a church together, we can, like Boaz, test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So I'll conclude by praying, and then we'll sing our final hymn. Dear Lord, Thank you for the plan that we know you are working through history and into eternity. Your plan to unite all things in heaven and earth in Jesus Christ, the one before whom one day every knee will bow. Though we don't see it all now, we know that one day we will. Meanwhile, we ask you to transform us through the renewing of our minds so that we can better discern your will. 
Give us wisdom to test what we believe comes from you so we can go forward with confidence, bringing our lives increasingly under the rule of Christ our Lord. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And what gift of grace is Jesus our Redeemer is our final hymn.